Today we're in 2 Samuel chapters 8 and 9, and so what we'll do is we'll take chapter 8, the first few verses, I'll introduce that. What we're looking at is a, a kingdom, because in chapter 8, uh, we see how that King David begins to have uh, conquests, etc., victories in war. And in chapter 9, we see him showing kindness. And so what I chose to entitle this installment of our study through 2 Samuel is a kingdom and kindness. You'll see that as we go through chapters 8 and 9. So let's begin reading together here in 2 Samuel chapter 8 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 4. We'll get into our study. 2 Samuel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. After this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg Amah from the hand of the Philistines. Then he defeated Moab. Forcing them down to the ground, he measured them off with a line. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death, and with one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zavah, as he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. Now, as we've been going through 2 Samuel, we stopped last week as we looked at chapter 7, and in chapter 7, we saw that chapter 7 recorded what has been called the Davidic covenant, a covenant that God had made with King David. The word covenant is also the word testament. It speaks of an agreement or it speaks of a promise. And what we had in, in uh, chapter 7 here in 2 Samuel was God made a promise to King David. And the promise that he gave to him related to a Messiah, Messiah who would come from his line, a Messiah who was going to rule an everlasting kingdom. We looked at that covenant. We saw that David promised David, or rather God promised David that his house his kingdom and his throne would be established forever. Now, as the Lord was making this promise to King David, David took that promise and was certain that God would fulfill it. David knew that he could trust God because he knew that God's promises are absolutely trustworthy. Notice with me that in chapter 7, verse 28, how David said, And now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are true. David knew that he could trust the Lord, and David knew that God would keep his promise to him. That's why he could rejoice. That's why he had such a trust, because he knew that God was trustworthy. He knew something about God. He knew that God was good to his word. I've been mentioning recently in the services today that if you could believe the first four words of the Bible as it's translated into English, if you can believe the first four words of the Bible, you can believe the rest of it. Because the first four words in the beginning, God gives to us everything that we need to know concerning whether or not there is such a thing or a one as a God. And, and two, if we believe in the beginning there is a God, then everything else after that that is said is going to be something that we can, we can trust in. It's going to be something that we can rely in. We can rely on God in His Word. And, and as, even as David said, you are God and your words are true, even so, if we believe the first four words of the Bible, we can believe the rest of it. It's interesting how that when you read your Bible and you begin in the book of Genesis and you arrive at chapter 3, verse 1, that the very first time anything is questioned, it's the Word of God. Because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it's Satan himself who asks the question, has God indeed said? And so question has always been concerning whether or not you have a reliable source of truth here. To this very day, the Word of God is maligned. The Word of God is, is spoken of as not being trustworthy, but David would have disagreed. David said, no, your words are true. I can trust in, in you. What you have to say is something I can rest in. I can be assured of. I'm confident of. I trust in you and your word because David knew God. Now, in the New Testament, in the book of 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, uh, John tells us God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. It's impossible, according to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, for God to lie. So when God speaks, he tells us the truth. There's nothing within him that is, is evil, and therefore when God speaks, he speaks the truth to us so we can receive, and that's what David is doing. He's receiving the promises. 
And he knew that God's promises were true. He could rely on them. And he also knew that his promises revealed that he was faithful, that he has integrity, that he's trustworthy, and that he is just. And he could trust in all of these things about God. In Psalm 138, which is a psalm of David, David wrote 77 psalms that are recorded in, in the book of Psalms, 150 psalms. 77 of those are attributed to David. In Psalm 138, verse 2, uh, David said, You have magnified your word above all your name. What an interesting way to put it. You have magnified your word above your name. Now, when he said you have magnified your word, that, that, that is translated, you have, you have exalted your promises. And so I can trust in your promises. You have magnified your promises above all your other attributes. And therefore I can trust you because you are faithful, you are true. Therefore I can trust in your word, your promises that you've given to me. And, and we can do the same. We can trust in the things of the Lord and, and we can take God at his word and we can act upon those things because David did and he had great joy in doing that. Because God had made a promise. David was rejoicing in it. Now after these things, as it says in verse 8, after this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And so David begins to, to uh, conquer the land, if you will. The Philistines had been a thorn in the side of Israel for some time. When you read the book of Judges, you see that Samson, one of the judges, dealt with Philistines. When you read 1 Samuel, you know that Samuel as well as Saul during their lifetime had to deal with the Philistines. David had to deal with them, and even so in 2 Samuel, he continues doing so. And what he's doing is now, he's now um, defeating them. He's subduing them, and he's taking their land from them. Now it's interesting how it says in verse 1 here in 2 Samuel chapter 8, David took Methag Amma from the hand of the Philistines. Methag Amma is also the name for the Philistine city Gath. And when you look at the Philistines, you'll see that they were on the, on the uh, shoreline, the western shoreline basically into the south there in the nation of Israel. They had five major cities and Gath was the principal city of those five. And so what is taking place here is David is beginning to subdue the land. And in doing so, what he does is he goes to their most important city and begins there. Now as he's doing this, it makes it more easy for him to subdue the rest of the country. Now that's an ancient method of, uh, of warfare that is still practiced to this day. Take a principal city and, and it opens the door for you to take the rest of that nation. That's what took place September 11th in 2001. When you look at what took place, it, it's the same kind of thing that David was doing. It's the same kind of tactic that was used then. Attack principal cities in order that you might subdue the nation. We know that there were two planes that flew into the Twin Towers there in New York City. We know that there was a plane that went into the Pentagon, and we know that there was another plane that was on its way to the capital city, uh, Washington, D.C., and what they were trying to do is they were trying to knock out the heart of, of the United States. New York City represents the uh, material wealth of this nation. The Pentagon represents the military strength and the capital is the soul of America. And so what they were trying to do is they were trying to use the tactics that you find in the Old Testament with David. David went into Gath, the principal city of the Philistines, and he subdued it. In taking them, the word would go out to the other cities that David was on the march and it would cause them great fear and make it easier for David to be able to take that land. And that's what he's doing. He's using an ancient technique that is used even to this day. Now notice verse 2. It says, He defeated Moab, forcing them down to the ground. He measured them off with a line. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death and with one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. Going on, it says, And David took, rather verse 3, David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. And so David is now going on. He's defeating. Now notice in verse, uh, verse 2, he defeats Moab. He forced them to the ground, and he divided them into three sections. 
What he's doing is he's moving to the east. He crossed the Dead Sea there and he's defeating the Moabites. He, div he divides their army into thirds. He kills two thirds of them and that just represents a complete destruction of the, of the Moabite army. Then it says he defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. So that means he went north to Syria and he recovered property up to the river Euphrates. Now what's, what makes that interesting, and you might want to mark this, is found in Genesis chapter 15 verse 18, is the Euphrates River is the border of the land that God gave to the nation of Israel. Because in Genesis 15, 18, when God was speaking to Abram, later known as Abraham, he said to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. And so he's taking land that belongs to the nation of Israel. He also captures their military. He disables their horses so they cannot pull chariots against him. Now as this is taking place, verse 5, when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus. The Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And so these Syrians are related to the people there of Zobah. So they come to their aid only to be defeated by David. They become vassals. They brought tribute to him. And to keep him in check, David builds garrisons there in order that he might have a military presence. But notice verse 6. I want to show you something. At the very bottom it says, or the last portion, so the Lord preserved David wherever he went. In all of his battles, God protected David from harm. As I mentioned, David wrote a lot of psalms, and David recognized God's hand of protection upon him. In Psalm 18, for example, verses 1 through 3, David said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Psalm 144, 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. David knew that God preserved him. This is something that you can know too. We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus taught me, without me you can do nothing, but with him I can do all things. And when you trust in the Lord and know him as your preserver, and when you, like David, can say, I love you, O Lord, then there's a great and a sure confidence that you can have in the things of God and the Lord himself. David had that great confidence, and God was with him, preserving him. David had courage and David had strength, but that came from the Lord. That's why he could say, he's my refuge, he's my deliverer, he's the rock, he's my fortress. He's the one in whom I trust. He's the one who gives me victories. He's the one who taught my hands to war, my fingers to battle. He's the one who's given to me the ability to do the things that I do. And I give him all uh, glory and praise for that. Because God is on my side. And, and seeing that he's on my side, I will, I will have victory. And I'll move from victory to victory. And that's what happened with him. And so David right now is, is going after the various kingdoms to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west. And he's, he's now unifying this because this is land that God had given to the nation of Israel. And the Lord preserves David everywhere he goes. Now as it's taking place, verse 7, David took the shields of gold that had belonged to the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Betah and from Berothai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took a large amount of bronze. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, then Toi sent Joram, his son, to King David to greet him and bless him because he had, sought, he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had been at war with Toi. And Joram brought with him articles of silver, articles of gold, and articles of bronze. So David begins to accumulate gold and bronze as spoils of war as well as gifts from other rulers. This one who was mentioned to wait, he was a king over Hamath, 
which was located 100 miles north of Damascus. And, and he's rejoicing because his old enemy is being overcome by David. And so he wants to establish relations with David, and thus he starts sending him gifts. But what is it that David does with the gifts and things that he's, he's either winning through war or receiving as gifts? Notice what he does with them. Verse 11, King David also dedicated these to the Lord along with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued, from Syria, from Moab, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, from Amalek, from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. What did he do? He dedicated these things to the Lord. He gave them to God, is what he did. Remember as I was sharing with you how David had in his heart a desire to build a temple for God? How that David, even as we saw in chapter 7, was reclining in his palace. He was living a, a life of ease and comfort. He was secure from his enemies. And as this was taking place, David began to think, it's just not right that I should live in such a beautiful place where the ark of God is hidden behind tent curtains. And you remember, we saw this just last time we were together, how that David had spoken to Nathan the prophet and said, I want to build God a house. And Nathan said, God is with you. Do, the, do, do what's on your heart. But the Lord spoke to David and taught him something and said, you're not going to do that. And we looked at the reason why. The reason that God gave to David that he wasn't going to be able to build the temple is because he was a warrior. He was a man who had blood on his hands. And God said, I'm not going to allow you to do that, but you have a son who's going to arise after you. His name is Solomon. He's going to be a man of peace. I'm going to allow him to build me a temple. What you wanted to do is a great thing, but you're not going to be gifted to be able to do that. Now, instead of David saying, well, that's fine with me, no problem, what does he do? Well, David, from the Lord, receives plans by the Spirit for the temple. And David begins to not only have these plans that God gives him by his Spirit, but he also begins to dedicate and dedicated the gold and silver and bronze and all that he needed in order that he might put it into the temple so that the building of the temple would be beautiful in its construction. And that shows the kind of heart that David had. And that's what we're seeing here when it says in verse 11, David, King David dedicated these to the Lord along with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued. David was the one who had given these things to the Lord. He gave them to the Lord because he wanted that temple to be built. And even though he wasn't going to be allowed to do it, he had the plans and he had the finances. He gave them to his son Solomon and he said, God told me, I can't do this. You'll do it, but I have these things ready for you. And so in a way, that temple that is called Solomon's temple really belonged to David all along in the sense of his dedication to God and the plans that were given to him. And so that's what he does. Now in 1 Chronicles in chapter 29, verses 3 and 4, David said, In my delight in the house of my God, the treasure I have of gold and silver, I give to the house of my God over and above all that I have already provided for the holy temple. 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the building. You see, David didn't just verbally dedicate. David actually did what he had verbally stated. In the New Testament, Jesus is speaking on one occasion, and he's speaking to religious hypocrites, and he says to them, what you're doing is wrong, and this is what makes what you're doing is wrong. You say, whatever, can, uh, whatever my mom or my dad, whatever my mother or my father can be profited by, you say that has been dedicated to God. And what was taking place during the time of Jesus was this. If, uh, if I had a house and I had furniture and my mom or my dad comes over and they visit me, now... My dad sees that I have an extra piece of furniture there and it's really not being used. And he says to me, son, to be honest with you, that, that chair that I have at home is falling apart and I really could use that, that chair. And seeing that you're not using it for anything, would you mind if I take that home so that I can use it in my home? And, and I say to him, you know, dad, I would ordinarily give that to you, but I've dedicated it to the Lord. And that's what Jesus said. You say that it's korban. You say that it is dedicated to God. And he says, and when you, when you do that, when your parents ask for something from you and you say it's korban, he says, what you are doing is you are dishonoring your parents and you are violating the word of God, which says, honor your father and your mother. And so David, David was one who had dedicated and really actually gave to God Whereas people during the time of Christ were saying this belongs to God, when in reality, they just didn't want to be a benefit or a blessing to their mom or to their dad. So when dad says, can I have it? They say, no, this has been dedicated to God. 
Jesus says that's hypocrisy. It's a wrong thing to do because you're saying you dedicated it to God, but in reality, you're the one who makes use of it. During the time of David, David received gifts. He had all of this gold that he took as war spoils, and he dedicated those things to God, and he used those things so that the temple might be built and dedicated to the Lord and be a glorious and beautiful temple. Well, in verse 13, continuing, it says, David made himself a name when he returned from the killing from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. He also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. So he's becoming famous in that region. He's famous for his courage in battle. He, he puts garrisons in Edom. This is the territory that's just south of Moab, east of the Dead Sea. And still, God is protecting him and blessing him. David reigned, verse 15, over all Israel. And David administered judgment and justice to all the people. As a, as a king, he's ruling righteously without respect to persons. He's making judgments impartially. He is shepherding them according to Psalm 78, verse 72, according to the integrity of his heart. And he's guiding them with the skillfulness of his hands. And as all of this is taking place, he now has a, a cabinet. And this is what we see in verses 16 through 18. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder, which is a state recorder. Zadok, the son of Ahitub, so his father was a little overweight. No, I'm just kidding. And Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. Sariah was the scribe or secretary, secretary of state. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the, the Carathites and the Palathites. That was David's security force, his, his personal bodyguard. You see that in 1 Samuel 30. And David's sons were chief ministers, meaning that they were princes of the court. So this gives you some insight into his cabinet. And so you see a kingdom. But now in chapter 9, we see kindness. Verse nine, uh, chapter, chapter 9, verse 1, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziva. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziva? He said, At your service. The king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziva said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziva said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Mahir, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. And so what we have here is David's character revealed. And I'm going to spend some time looking at this because I think that we have some practical application to make to our lives as we look at chapter 9 here. David's character is being revealed because notice with me in verse 1, he's actively seeking to bless somebody. He asks the question, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? This is his character being revealed. I want to show kindness to the house of Saul. And I'm doing so because of the promise I made to Saul's son, Jonathan. Now remember with me, when we were studying in 1 Samuel, in chapter 24, that, that Saul had made David swear that he would not do any harm to his heirs. Well, David already was, was inclined to that because in the same book, 1 Samuel chapter 20, David had made a promise to, to Jonathan in, in chapter 20, verse 15, to Jonathan, and he said that he would be a blessing to his heirs. And, and Jonathan had asked him, make sure that you don't do harm to my heirs. And David had swore to him an oath and stated to him, you know, I'm going to be kind to your family. And that's all we see here in chapter 9, verse 1, is, is David wanting to fulfill his, his oath, his promise that he made. Now, as this has taken place, there's a, there's a servant of the house of Saul. This man's name is Ziva. This is a former servant of Saul. He was aware of Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Now, as we've looked into this book here in chapter 4, verse 4, we were introduced to this young man, Mephibosheth, who was five years old, and as, his, as he was escaping with his nurse, he was being carried, his nurse dropped him and injured him, and he became crippled in his feet. 
Now, when David became king, Mephibosheth would have been 12. In this chapter, we're going to see that he's actually now married and he has a son of his own. And so time has passed. He's now living in a place called Lodavar, which is in a place that's east of the Jordan River. It's about 10 miles south of the Sea of Galilee. And David wants to do something for him. So he asks the question, is there anybody that survived? Well, Ziva says, yes, there's somebody who has survived. His name is Mephibosheth. He's the one who is lame in his feet. So what you have here is you have a man named Ziva who has been pretty much taking care of the house of Saul, even though Saul has been displaced as king. We're going to see in a moment that he's a wealthy man. But he's also a man who's aware of where Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, is. When asked, is there anybody alive, normally that would be a question from a king saying, if there are any heirs that can aspire to this throne, I will put them to death. That's really what David could be saying. So Ziva gives him up. He says, oh yeah, he's in Lodivar. That's where he's at. And so that shows you something of the heart of this man. He doesn't protect this young man. Why? Well, because he's become rich taking care of the assets of Saul's uh, household. And, he's, he's, and you'll see him in a minute. He's, he's a man with many sons and many servants himself. And so he gives up Mephibosheth. Now, as he does so, notice in verse 5, uh, King David sent and brought him out of the house of Mahir, the son of Amiel, from Lodevar. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here's your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. He bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? The king called to Ziba. Saul's servant and said to him I've given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house you therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat but Mephibosheth your master's son shall eat bread at my table always now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants Ziba said to the king according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micha, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziva were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, where he ate continually at the king's table. He was lame in both of his feet. When Mephibosheth was brought before David, he was afraid. He knew that the kings would normally put to death any heirs or successors to the throne. That's why when David looked at him, he said, Are you Mephibosheth? And he says, Yes, I am. Instead of doing him harm, he wants to bless him. Now when he says to him, and this I think is an interesting phrase, when he says in verse 8, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? A dead dog is worthless. And what he's simply doing is he's speaking out of humility, he's saying, what have I done to deserve such a blessing? It's a humble statement. I'm simply a dead dog. A dead dog has no value. Living dogs have value. Dead dogs have none. And so he's simply saying to him, I have no value. Why are you trying to be kind to me? What is it that you, why are you doing this? So that's an act of humility on his part. As I look at this passage, I see some things that we can see concerning the Lord. One, I want you to see this with me. Look at verse 1 once again. I'm going to develop something with you. It says in verse 1, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? You know, people have this attitude that I, I think is sometimes incorrect. David wants to have a relationship. He wants to have a, be a blessing to somebody out of an oath's sake, out of a vow, out of a promise's sake. He had stated to Jonathan that he would do Jonathan's heirs good. And so he simply wants to do good for the sake of his promise to Jonathan. 
I really do believe that people have a tendency of thinking that God is not good. That's why like Mephibosheth, when he comes before David, is expecting to be put to death or harmed. That's why David has to say to him, you don't have to be afraid. Because he knows that standing before the king could be a death sentence. A lot of people don't understand the power that the king have, kings had. But in a way, you can apply that to how people are with the Lord. As long as we're doing fine, as long as everything's going okay for us, as long as our lives are, are you know, coasting along okay, we don't think much of eternity. And there are people who actually have this attitude about God where they think, well, you know, it's, you know, so what? You believe in God? I don't believe in God. What's the big deal? They say that because they're in the comfort of their home. They say that because they're alive right now. They say that because they're not standing before God. When you stand before God, it's going to be an entirely different kind of thing. You can have all the bravado in the world that you have right now. You can be as boastful as you want and arrogant as you can be. Now saying, I'm not afraid of God. I don't have any fear of him at all because at this moment you're not standing there before him as your judge. His authority right now is not being wielded on you as it will ultimately. And that's why you can stand and you can say the things that you have, have said in the past. And you can say them about God without any fear. My son David just turned 31 on Friday. It was his 31st birthday. And I was remembering just this morning my son David, who's now such a man, but when he was just a little boy, he was about nine years of age. I can remember coming home from the office. And as I walked into the door, through the door into the, into the foyer there into our home, as I was walking in to the entrance, my son David was just a few feet from me, but he didn't notice me enter into the house. And he had his little hands on his hips. And he was looking up at his mom. And as I was walking in, quietly closing the door behind me, he was raising his voice. And he was about nine years old, and he's yelling at his mom. And he's saying to his mom, I don't have to do that if I don't want to. With all of that bravado and courage that a nine-year-old can have talking to mom like that. He said, I don't have to do that if I don't want to. But as he said that, Marie, my wife, was looking past him at me. And he noticed that she was looking past him. So he turns around and as he's saying, I don't have to do that if I don't want to. He sees me standing over him, looking down at him. And then he looks back at his mom and he says, but I want to. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> but I want to. And I said, of course you do, my son. <laughs> We're brave. We're brave when... when, when everything's okay. We're brave when we don't realize that authority is knocking on the door. We're brave when we're not standing before the throne of God. We're very brave. But I guarantee you we're not, we're not going to be brave if we're standing before him having denied him an entire lifetime and then dying in sin. I guarantee you you will not be brave. But the bottom line is, is this. David wanted to do good and David sought him out and David had him brought to him so that David could bless him so that David could take the fear from him and David could make him a member of his family eating as a son at the king's table that's what he wanted to do with Mephibosheth and that's what he did with Mephibosheth Jesus sought you out and perhaps like Adam you may have been afraid when you first heard his voice because the Bible tells us that when Adam took of that forbidden fruit and his eyes were opened and he knew good and evil by experience that Adam fashioned for himself a fig leaf in order to cover his own nakedness and the Bible tells us that 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 the Lord God was there in the the garden and called to Adam and that when, when God called out, Adam, where are you? Adam responded. And, and Adam said that he was hiding because he was naked. And God asked him the question, who told you that you were naked? And the whole conversation that we see there in the book of Genesis chapter 3 is a picture of a God who seeks out the lost. When God said to Adam where are you? It wasn't because God didn't know where Adam was and therefore needed Adam to inform him where he was. It was a cosmic hide and seek. 
you know, where are you, where are you? It wasn't anything like that. What it was, was a heartbroken God calling out to a son who was lost in such a way that it should pierce the heart of that son to hear the broken tears of the voice of the one seeking him so that that one Adam could see the love and concern his father had for a lost son and be cut to the heart so that he might see that his, son was seeking, his father was seeking him so that he might find him in order that he might have fellowship with him that had been broken by that sin. And what God was saying when he said to him, Adam, where are you? Was, Adam, confess. Tell me where you are. I took of that tree that you, for, you said I couldn't take of and I did eat. He had to confess. You see, the Bible tells us that God seeks and saves those who are lost. We may have this, this fear of confrontation because part of coming to the Lord is going to include us giving up things that we may be addicted to or want to keep. If I come to the Lord, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be able to do the things that I enjoy doing so much right now, someone says. You know, I like the meth, or I like the, I like the, the crack. I, I, li I like the, the, the alcohol. I like the, the promiscuity. I, I, like, I like what I'm doing. Why, why would I want to give that up? I'm going to actually give something up that I enjoy doing to what? Become a church boy? Are you kidding me? To have to look so weird and squirrely and go to church and carry a Bible and all of that? Are you kidding me? That's not cool. What's really cool is me walking around when I'm 60 years old and having no teeth and having a pot belly and having no family. That's going to be really cool. But right now, I look pretty good. I mean, every beer con commercial I ever see has a bunch of young people enjoying themselves in a bar. Every time I see somebody smoking a cigarette, they look really cool, don't they? Real sophisticated, don't they? I don't think about emphysema. I don't think about lung cancer. I don't think about all of that I'm spending on that stuff to kill mice. I don't think about that. Are you kidding me? I enjoy this. I used to think that smoking was a real, real cool thing to do. My mama for many years smoked. When she got right with the Lord, she gave it up and hasn't had a cigarette in, in almost 40 years now, 39 years. My mama smoked since she was a little girl and she gave it up when she got right with the Lord. And me, I saw my mom when she would smoke cigarettes and my mom looked so cool. I mean, she'd have that cigarette in her, in her mouth and her cup of coffee and that cigarette smoke would kind of waft into her eyes and she'd kind of close them kind of cool. And I'm telling you, man, I thought, oh, sophisticated. I liked it, man. She looked so cool. And I was about 15, and I used to wear this pompadour. And our hair was all pulled out like that. It's all cool. And I sprayed it with hairspray. It's like a helmet. And I had my cigarette in my mouth. My mom used to turn on the stove and light her cigarette from the burner. Oh, cool. Yep, I stuck my hair into it. I had the first afro in Norwalk. It blew up, boom, like that. And I like Wiley Coyote, you know. But man, did I look cool. And you do, you think that way. You know it and I know it. You think it is all good. It's all cool. Man, it's the coolest thing when your friends say to you, man, I saw you last night and you were all covered with your own vomit. Yeah, I had a good time. And I, I, I awoke in my own vomit more than once, and I tell you the truth when I say that. Bottom line. And then you tell people, man, I had such a great time last night, I just don't remember it. But when you tell me what I did, I know it was fun. And that's how I was. And you could not argue me out of that. You couldn't. You couldn't tell me walking with God was better than that. Are you kidding me? You've got to be kidding me. Man, I love to party. I love the things that I'm doing. I don't want to give that stuff up. I want to hold on to that. I want that. That's how a lot of people are. They want to keep it because they think that if they give that up, they're going to live a life that is really not worth living. They're, going to, they're, they're thinking, man, if I give this up, then what do I have? I won't have any friends. I won't have any... I, I won't, you know, what am I going to do? Go to church every day of the week? What are you talking about? See, they don't understand the peace that you have when you come to God. They don't understand that. The peace. I used to put my head on a pillow at night knowing that somebody was after me because I had stolen something from them or whatever. I knew that. There were places I wouldn't go sometimes because I knew there were guys after me there because I'm not going to go over there because I ripped off the radio or I stole their money. I knew that. 
And I'd look into the back, I'd be driving, I'd look into my rear view mirror and I'd see a black and white behind me. Man, I would freak because I was usually holding. I usually had some drugs on me or I was drunk. And I'd look into that rear view mirror and I'd say, oh God, please don't let them pull me over. I can remember I was in Norwalk, I was driving home from a friend's house, I'd been smoking pot, it was three in the morning. I was very, very loaded. And I was driving this one street that didn't have any it was a two-laner, but it didn't have any stripes, any white lines that were dividing. And I was driving with one eye closed because I was so loaded I could hardly even see what was in front of me. And I pulled up to a stop sign. And then I pulled away as I was driving. I looked in my rearview mirror and there was a CHP patrolman right behind me. Now, I was driving a 1962 Ford Falcon station wagon. I had long hair and I had a peace flag in the back, covering the back window. We used to call that a bust car because they're gonna just pull over, they're gonna bust you. And my side windows were painted black, you couldn't see into my car. But I, was, I looked in my left rear view mirror and I saw the, the patrolman behind me and I thought, oh no, I had just been arrested for something just shortly before that. And I, my dad had said, you go to jail again, I'm not, I'm not bailing you out. And I still remember it was like yesterday. My, I, clo I had one eye closed as I was driving, trying to just drive home. And I remember coming to Imperial Highway. I could take a left or I could take a right. And as I looked, I saw his blinker go to the right. I took a left. And I pulled away from him and he drove home. He didn't pull me over. I got home and I started going, oh, man, that was a close one. I had a lot of those, a lot of close calls like that friend of mine's lighting up and smoking a joint and he turns and looks right at a cop <laughs> and turns and looks at me and, and the cop was looking the other direction when that happened I had a lot of close calls like that and I thought oh this is living you're gonna take this from me there are a lot of people like that God wants to give you peace God wants to give you joy. You go from one relationship to another and every one of them, you either break somebody's heart or they break yours. You go from one thing to another and you don't have any joy in your life at all. You're miserable and that's part of the reason you're always loaded. That's part of the reason you move from person to person, from thing to thing, from one activity to another because you're looking for something to make you happy and it doesn't, it's just temporary. God says, I've got something that's beyond that. I give you joy. I can give you peace. I can give you love. I can give you those things. Those are the things I have for you. I can give you forgiveness. You'll never have forgiveness until you ask from the Lord. And I'll forgive you. And you know what? He's actively seeking you out. The Bible tells us that God is looking for his sheep. He says, I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will seek them out and I will find them. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was, or rather David was doing. David said, is there somebody that I can bless? Yes, there is. A cripple. He can't come to you. But you know what? They brought him. They brought him to David. He was crippled. And that's what we were. We were incapable of walking. Even as in Mark chapter 1 when Andrew had been pointed to Jesus by John the Baptist and spent the day with Jesus and discovered who he was and he went and he got his brother, the Apostle Peter, who became the Apostle Peter, and, and, he's, and he brought his brother to Jesus. That's what we do. And this is called, by the way, evangelism. And the evangelism that we do has a gentleness to it. It's, it's a loving evangelism. It's a loving concern for people. It's, it's that love that you have for people. You want them right with God, and you love them enough to tell them the truth. There are some people who, who do have, it seems like almost an anger in them when it comes to trying to win people to Christ. They're angry, they, like they're saying, if you don't come to Christ, you're going to go to hell, and I'm going to be happy to see that. Sometimes they stand on street corners and they yell at people. Sometimes they go with signs at, at gay pride parades and it says God hates fags and they have this anger in them towards people and they want these people to die and to burn and that isn't the heart of the Lord. That isn't the heart of the Lord. 
God loves the world so much he gave his son. There's got to be a loving evangelism, a love enough to tell the people the truth, but to love them, and they'll know the difference. People know when you love them and you're telling the truth, and how difficult it may be sometimes to tell them the truth, because you'd rather say something different. You'd rather say, you know, everybody goes to heaven, don't even worry about it, enjoy your life. And it's very difficult sometimes when you, when you evangelize, when you share, because people don't understand. They think you're filled with hate, and you're not. You're loving them enough to tell them what is true. And you say, you need to come to the Lord, because God wants to bless you. But you can't, because you're crippled, so he calls for you, and someone will bring you. The Spirit of God brings you to Jesus, and he blesses you. David wanted to have this man, Mephibosheth, at his table. He shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to bless him at my table. That's what the Lord does with you. God has made you. When you come to Christ and you say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. I need your help. I believe, Jesus, you died for me. I do believe that. He says, I'm going to make you a son at my table and you're going to eat what I've prepared for my children. I'm going to bless you. In Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8, it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. Its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. When everything around you is drying up, God says, because your roots are deep into the water of life, in my spirit, and my word, you're going to continue to produce. When everything dries up around you, I'll keep you fresh, and I'll keep you alive. And you will be blessed because you have a relationship with God through Jesus. David wanted to be a blessing. Mephibosheth thought he was going to die. But when Mephibosheth was given was life as a son, almost like the son of the king, there at the king's table, while the one who at one time pretty much was ruling over his life and living off the things that belonged to him became a servant with his sons, making sure that his family was cared for. And David wanted to bless because David is a picture sometimes of the love of God for us.